Christ is risen. risen Amen. And now what happens? Um, What does a life with a living God mean? Besides the glorious promise of salvation, how do we experience and continue to live the Easter reality today and each day? Um, What does it mean for Christ's risen spirit to be in us and among us, to live with a new identity that is in this living Christ? Well, as you begin living with this presence of God in your life, God begins shaping you day by day from the inside out. It begins with your profession of faith, your declaration of trust, your baptism. God begins shaping you into living the Jesus life more and more throughout your life. In a word, it means going deep, which is our new series. And I apologize, I've played too much backyard sandlot football in my life. Going deep is such a powerful phrase to me. Uh, It's always a thrill when somebody would say to me, Ross, you go deep. I was like, yeah. One, because I run at the speed of a refrigerator. Two, Two, there's always a great thrill that if I make that catch, it could be a game winner. Save the team. Well, friends, when you ask, seek, and knock on God's door, the risen Christ responds. And you begin this changed way of living. You begin a life relationship with God of faith that includes prayer asking God for things in your life, and God asks things of you. And since our God is a big God, sometimes he asks us to do big things, daunting things, challenging things. God will be working in your life to provoke you, to provoke others to real hope. Radical hope, life-changing hope. So let's dive in. As Kaylee has mentioned, we are diving into Jonah. And we're looking at chapter 1 today. If you brought your Bibles, we also have it projected. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But... Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, 
What should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah, threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Dear God, what a story. Thank you for this reading of your holy word. Help us. Holy Spirit, please help me with my words. Help us with our reflections. Lord, to hear your voice and not run away, but to say yes to you in faith. Amen. Get back. Get back. Here's a little song. Jonah was a man who thought he was a loner, but he really was God's man. Go to Nineveh and tell them that I love them. Jonah said, hey, no way, man. Get back. Get back. Get back. Go back to Nineveh. Ah. Right? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What was Jonah thinking? Goodness. He... uh, Running away from Yahweh intentionally buys a ticket to go the wrong way. Go to the great city of Nineveh, preach against it because its wickedness has come up to me. God said go. Jonah said no. Can you do that? Jonah runs away from the Lord. He heads for Tarshish. Uh, He went down to Joppa, bought a ticket. And after paying the fare, he sails for Tarshish, fleeing from the Lord. Nineveh, okay, let's get oriented. Do, 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 do. Right? Nineveh is to the east and a little bit north from where Jonah is. And he buys a ticket at the Joppa Travel Agency for Spain, Tarshish, which was on the west coast of Spain, almost 180 degrees in the opposite direction. And this reference to Tarshish stretches the geology of of the Old Testament. Geography, my bad. In God's face, I want to book a ticket. Jonah goes AWOL, absent without Lord. Only, oops, theological mistake. You can't do that with the Lord. So the boat pulls out of port, right? Headed. It's a lovely Mediterranean voyage, right? Everybody has already received their lays. There's a marimba band playing. Uh, uh, There's a shuffleboard game already started on the Lido deck. Jonah's putting on sunscreen while he's joking with his new shipboard friends about how, can you believe it? I am running away from God. Nineveh, who would want to go there? And God calmly says, cue the wind. And the ship faces this horrible storm, threatening to break it apart. This is a storm. The shields are weakening, Captain. The ship can't take much more of this. It's one of those scenes. The sailors are each crying out to their own God. Isn't that an interesting summary of society, culture, and life in one sentence? They're panicking and praying at the same time. Welcome, friends, to this remarkable story and the three rules of Jonah. Rule number one, 
God is in control. And God's control centers around his glory, his purpose, and mission of love. Get this, while the storm is raging, Jonah is sleeping in what I believe was a depressive state of self-centeredness, but he finally confesses his guilt when the captain wakes him up. Yeah, me and the crew, we're having an everyone pray to your own God to see what works party up on the top deck. We were wondering, instead of sleeping, if you'd like to come and join us so that we don't die. And Jonah's response points out rule number one. He answers, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. I learned that for many ancient Middle Eastern and Asian religions long ago, it was commonly believed a god who could control the ocean was usually viewed as top god. And so Jonah's ID claim here is on point and finally at last on purpose. He's a Hebrew. He is a part of the called people of Abraham whose original covenant called them through the years to be a people of blessing to all the other nations. But Jonah, Jonah speaks of this God, and it leads to rule number two of Jonah's story. God chooses to use, choose you in his plans and mission. We looked at this rule yesterday in our Faith Tools workshop. Some people call it God's predestination, how God works to save those in our lives. And God is able to order events in this world to achieve his purposes. Jonah says, pick me up, throw me into the sea, it will become calm. I know it is my fault that this storm has come upon you. Now this is a very compressed story, Jonah. But one can only imagine that this is now a pivotal point for this petulant prophet. It's me. It's my fault. And one can wonder. Perhaps Jonah was wanting to at last atone for his mistake of running away from God to save Nineveh. Maybe he's thinking, at least, at last now, I can do something that will at least save this crew on this ship. Throw me overboard. And so in his desperate, come clean confession, he admits to this sin, how he chose to reject God's call, and it would require a sacrifice in the mode of an atonement to bring God's peace and restoration. It must be me. And this leads us to rule number three of Jonah. If you reject rule number two, go back to rule number one. God remains in control when we don't. And look at this. Even when we choose to reject God, he doesn't immediately reject us. I mean, why didn't God simply say, okay, goodbye, let's pick someone else? No, it was Jonah for Nineveh, God's plan. And God would control this story for the people's pardon, for Jonah to be the messenger. And at this, the men greatly feared the Lord. Our story in chapter 1 concludes, they offer a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. These pagan sailors, it's a marvel. They see God's long-suffering grace at work. These pagan sailors with their pagan captain they learn to fear and worship the living God, even in the midst of Jonah's guilt. And so a question that comes out of Jonah 1 is why? Why does someone just simply choose to reject God? How do you become disobedient to God and God's assignment of giving a warning, a message, to others. 
Well, one idea I want to suggest today, uh, I'm calling it the Nineveh negativity bias. Barry Pearman is a spiritual formation writer, and he's pointed out that in the English game of lawn bowling, the small heavy bowl that you roll always has a curve to it because it's intentionally weighted to one side. I don't understand it, but it always has an arc. And he points out that's like us. We each have a weighted side in our living and thinking called a negativity bias. And it's formed from our negative experiences and our design for self-protection. Aline Gregorian is a trainer of United States Special Forces, and she has stated, you can take yourself down with your own thoughts faster than any enemy can. And don't we at times? Our brains are hardwired to see threats first and positive outcomes last. Rick Hansen, a psychologist, puts it this way. Your brain is continually looking for bad news. As soon as it finds some, it fixates on it with tunnel vision, fast tracks it into memory storage, and then reactivates it at the least hint of anything even vaguely similar. But good news, he says, that gets a kind of neural shrug. Uh, whatever. Hansen continues, he says, in effect, the human brain is like Velcro for negative experiences, but Teflon for positive ones. And friends, when God begins leading us into positive purpose activities, our negativity bias kicks in, our mindset for self-protection becomes a mindset for self-centeredness, which is ill health, disobedience to God's will and call. And this is why we must continually be working, asking for God's help in overcoming our negativity bias. Friends, the Bible teaches that you are the you joint in God's differential. I want to do some car talk. Uh, Y'all know what a differential is in a car, right? Looks like that. It's the part of your car's powertrain that translates the power from the engine outward to the wheels that gives you forward movement. I want to say that the church of Jesus Christ is God's differential in this world. We are God's gears for bringing his presence and life over death, moving it forward in real situations and lives. And in every powertrain of a car, you will also find a U-joint looks like this. The U in U-joint stands for universal joint. I like to think it stands for you and me, right? We are a key gear where you are in your life of translating God's message of resurrection hope and comfort and peace into the lives of people around you. Even places like Nineveh. Nineveh was an Assyrian city known for its cruelty. Oh, inhumane treatment, witchcraft, sorcery, violent oppression. And by the way, did you notice how a U-joint looks a lot like a cross. When you accept the cross of Jesus Christ suffering and death and the victory of his empty tomb into your life, Jesus gives you a cross. And we begin, we begin to learn day by day how to live that sacrificing life, giving up from who we are, what we have for the work of love. And it's worth the return. Getting in gear with Jesus' mission. Friends, I believe every one of us has a, I call it my everyday calling. And we also, each of us have what I call is my specific calling. Now please, this is me doing some theologizing, but I think I'm right. 
One is the backdrop to the other, and the other reinforces the other. My everyday calling is my reach prayer list. The people I see and relate to on a regular basis. Uh, often it's about 8 to 15 people who live near you or with you or you encounter at work or school. They are my everyday mission field that God's given to me. I, I, I need to intentionally write their names down as an act of faith. I, I try to pray for them every day. I, I try to care and invest in their life with sincere love and help. I try to speak and show and invite gospel potential opportunities when I can. And I want to continually prepare, God, please make me better in my calling. Now, my specific calling, that refers to your unique giftedness as a disciple of Jesus. It's a specific area or mission or aptitude God has given you to serve his needy world. For me, a specific calling is serving and working as a pastor. For some of you, it's fixing cars. You know what a differential is. Or being simply but wonderfully a prayer warrior. Or an encourager. Maybe you're a teacher. Maybe you serve in medicine. You're a counselor. Maybe you're a business person selling a worthwhile product and helping people be employed. Maybe you're an artist. Maybe you sing on a praise team. For Jonah, his specific calling was Nineveh. Friends, becoming open to God's presence means becoming open to God's purpose. And this may take a while for some of us. I think for most of us, it takes a lifetime to learn and experience. It starts here at this table. We encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit, of the risen Christ in communion. Here we remember his sacrifice, the cost of God's love given to us. It's also here we receive the bread, the cup, the strength from Christ's presence for us that helps us in our work and life for him. And a key question we should ask at the table today is, are you trusting more in your inadequacies than in God's adequacies for you for any situation? Because I can tell you, in some respects, we are each inadequate for God-sized roles. And it can make you want to go running or get on board a ship. But look here, who goes with us today, every day? Look who is giving us this morning his holy presence for our strength, inspiration. What if after feasting in Christ's presence here, we offer to God and others a line that is adapted from Jonah. And we say and live, I am a Christian. I worship the Lord of the heavens, the sea, and the land. The Lord of the cross and the empty tomb. Throw me into your storm. I'm here for you. And I bring with me the Savior of the world. Help us, Lord, with our negative views, our fears. Lord, that voice in us that says, oh, I can't do that. Help us even firstly, Jesus, to listen to your call and assignments, to notice the people in our lives, and to offer them the saving presence, Jesus, that is you. Lead us in your ways today, Lord. And when we're afraid, give us your faith to hold on, to go with you, and to be an agent of your love. Amen.